Hi, I am Mrs. Sloan, and this is a video for my AP Biology students. For us, this is all about behavioral ecology. This is video two. Video one, you want to watch that if you want to talk about the uh, genetic basis of inheritance or environmental basis of inheritance. And we also talked about, real briefly, animal communication. In this video, let me make myself a little bit smaller and present. Okay, and get a pointer. Okay, in this video, we're gonna talk, we're going to discuss behaviors that increase fitness. Boy, that sounds like unit seven even, right? It all circles together, baby. And then behavioral strategies organisms use to acquire and use energy. We'll see how it all ties together, all right? So behavioral ecology, the first thing you need, by the way, in my classes, in the descriptor of this video are the group shared notes, and we are on 43.5. Four of the group shared notes, column one is scaffolding. I'll help you fill it in. And column two, I encourage you to put in pictures and images that help you. So we are on behavioral ecology, the study of how natural selection, uh, unit seven, shapes behavior, shapes behavior. So the idea is that certain behaviors like grooming one another, okay, certain behaviors must have a genetic basis. And we looked at some evidence for that in video one and, and certain those certain behaviors lead to increased survival, right? They're bonding together. There's some sociobiology going on in this grooming and you get a tasty little snack and, um, and increase the production of offspring. Therefore, behaviors that we observe today must have some adaptive value, must have some adaptive value. So the first one we'll talk about, I'm in the way, is territory. Okay, defending a certain territory. And you'll see us dip back into previous units multiple times now as we're coming to a close for AP Bio here in Unit 8. So territory, it's a portion of an animal's range that it defends for its exclusive use. Defending that area is called its territoriality. All right, so foraging behavior, I think you have a few things you need to fill in. It's all right here. Foraging behavior not only includes the process of, you know, eating, for, but it all it's, uh, but also mechanisms used for searching for that food, for recognizing that food, and for capturing that food. Those are all foraging behaviors. So just fill in your notes on that. The optimal foraging model, what that says is you have to do a cost-benefit analysis, right? You're not going to see a lion going in trying to find ants to eat, right? The amount of energy it would take for him to find ants, he and to get enough ants to meet his nutritional needs, it's not going to work for him. He's going to need a larger prey, right? And um, hopefully you understand the irony of this little cartoon right here. Okay, so you got your notes filled in on that. Pause if you need to. So you have to look at the cost of it, right? And it's a compromise. All right, defending a territory. Why do you defend your territory? Well, either you have really good food there or mates that you can have there. It could be even shelter, things like that. When you defend your territory, it, it's gonna cost you, right? It costs you energy. Um, you could get hurt. You have to maybe get larger or bigger or stronger in order to defend your territory. But it must be, this territory uh, must be uh, uh, adaptive, right? And it's going to be more likely during reproductive events. Why? Because your fitness is measured in your ability to pass on your genes. So you're going to want to have the best mate and the best chances for your offspring. Okay. Um, and I think I gave you all the notes there. And then... Um, types of, I gave you some examples too, given, sing, cheetahs, urinate, fight, dominance, displays. All right. So then let's look at some different types of relationships organisms might have. They might be polygamous. Okay. So what polygamy means is you have one male with several females. And so I was giving you an example of that. And um, so single male mates with multiple females. This is valuable when females clump around a food source and a limited number are receptive at any one time. A limited number are receptive at any one time. Polyandrous um, right here. So this is a single female with multiple males and you can see um, this would be like bees. Um, this is rare. And this is when female mates with multiple males get more male help because you're really unsure of who's your daddy, right? Um, monogamy 
Um, this is about 18%. This is pair bond, both males and females assist. And this is because why it increases their fitness. I'm so sorry. My dog is barking. It increases their fitness when they work together to raise the offspring. And then, um, promiscuity is, um, shopping around on either side. And sometimes that can be adaptive as well. So, um, sexual selection um, and these are, this is a little bit of a review for you. Um, remember we talked about sexual dimorphism already. Um, oh, sorry for sexual selection. It's a form of natural selection that favors features that increase an animal's chance of mating. So this is sexual dimorphism where the males and females look different from each other. This can lead to competitions. Um, we've talked about um, intrasexual selection is when the males are competing with each other and competing to inseminate the female. Intersexual selection is when maybe Betty is choosing between the males. Um, so we talked about the why Betty would choose. We had two hypotheses, the good gene hypothesis that she's looking for the biggest and the strongest. And these intrasexual competitions may lead to that. Um, or if you're in a polygamous situation, these types of competitions might lead to just males that can then control the females. Um, and then the runaway hypothesis is if she's looking for somebody who's, you know, really sparkly, right? Really pretty, all the different colors that they might have. All right, so intersexual female choice, and then intrasexual is male competition, male competition. All right, and then I just made a little chart for you if that would help. You could kind of pause for a second and screen capture. Here's the biology, and here is the behavior that's tied to it. Intrasexual selection leads to this kind of behavior, dominance, hierarchies, and territoriality, whereas intersexual selection, we have two genes here for that. All right. Now, sociobiology, this applies the principles, and that's the only word you need is applies, applies the principles of evolutionary biology to the study of social behavior of animals. All right, so looking at evolution and why we do what we do when we're in a population. So there's advantages and there are disadvantages. So advantages like these meerkats to living together, more eyes to see, look for predators. Um, you can distract predators. You have babysitters. Typically the teens, when they're not reproducing yet, are helping to raise the young. They have group signals and they can work together. The disadvantages of living together, you can have more disagreements. Fewer overall young if you have just one female or one male that's reproducing, and it's very easy to spread parasites. So you do a cost-benefit analysis, and if you are living together, then the benefit must outweigh the cost. So um, the only one you need on advantages is avoid predators, raise young, and find food. And then I give you everything for disadvantages. All right. So... Let's talk about one of the things that could happen in these social situations. So you have meerkats standing guard over uh, the community, that population. And um, they will start to scream if they see a predator flying around. Now, when a meerkat screams like that, that puts them in danger, right? Because who's the predator gonna see? The screamer right away. They're not running and hiding, they're standing and screaming. You can look at ants and you can look at how some of them will fight to their death um, and come out and defend. So why do they do that? That's the question because if you're trying to increase your fitness, if you're a dead meerkat, right? You think, well, it didn't really increase my fitness. Why did I do it? So then you come up the word with of altruism. Altruism, and does it exist? I'm not saying that it does. Altruism is self-sacrifice. And, and, and if you know what this is, this is from Hunger Games, and um, I volunteer as tribute, right? So she volunteered for her sister because she was worried about her sister surviving the Hunger Games, right? So was she being altruistic or was she looking for, was there some other reason? So altruism versus self-interest. I'm not saying that she was selfish. Okay, so when you are in a situation like this in social arrangement, you're like, I'm going to get the beetles and bugs and parasites off you if you get the beetles and bugs off me. So it's like, I'll scratch your back and do work for you that doesn't, you know, if you help me out in return. So that would be a real direct um, one, but we're talking about like, 
death sacrifice. Scratching somebody's back is not death, right? So why would they give it up entirely? Well, remember fitness is your ability to pass on your genes. So let me help you with the notes a little bit. Altruism, a behavior that has the potential to decrease the lifetime reproductive success of the altruist while benefiting the reproductive success of another member of the society, okay? Another member of the society. So remember, fitness is being able to pass on your genes. Now, direct selection is keeping yourself alive and your offspring alive. That's your direct selection. Indirect selection is that of your relatives, and that is referred to as kin selection, success of relatives. So on inclusive fitness, genes can be passed on in two ways. Direct parent to offspring, that's the word you need, parent to offspring, reproductive success of the individual and then their child, right? And indirect is a relative that reproduces, and this is called kin selection. So let's look at some examples of that. Um, one example would be like social animals like bees, wasps, and ants. So it's all about the queen, right? She's the only one that's diploid. The males are haploid. They are sharing so many genes that they are actually increasing their fitness by fighting because they're protecting the queen and everyone else and so that they are more likely to get their genes passed on because they are closely related, okay? Another example is chimpanzees. The females mate with several males. It's a close group. They're probably um, genetically related. So what's good for one is good for all. So chimps, when there's a mating, a coupling going on, they don't interfere, just watch because it's possible you're getting some of your genes passed on. So that's what you need on your notes. Close groups, so probably genetically related. And then there's the, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine, and this is these vampire bats. So what happens here is they live in these clusters and they go out and hunt um, at night. And when they do that, what they, they need to get a blood meal. And so they've got to find some large herbivore and lick its blood and then fly back. And then um, in the daytime, then they're all in their uh, groups. They stay in pods together. So if you fly back and you don't get a meal, then what you, you know, you went hungry because you weren't able to capture any blood. All you have to do is uh, 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 lick your your neighbor in your pod and they will turn and that's a sign stimuli it's a releaser for them to regurgitate some of their blood meal to feed you and they're doing that because they know that if it happened to them you would do the same that is reciprocal altruism and what they have found is when there's cheaters where they take a blood meal from somebody but they don't reciprocate in turn everybody knows and then they completely isolate next time they ask for a meal they're like no go and they will not help them out and then usually they're weakened and die so the big ticket here on why does that meerkat stand and scream who does he have down below probably has some relatives right that he's trying to protect some offspring so there is a reason why they do it okay so probably no altruism right you're not sacrificing your genes, you're ensuring that your genes are passed on. All right, now let's review a couple of things to understand a few more behaviors. So the first thing we need to remember is homeostasis, right? Homeostasis, I had this little game, but I'll help you out right here. This means maintenance of internal environment in a cell or organism by means of self-regulating uh, mechanisms that curtail fluctuations above and below a normal range. Now, in your notes, um, you just need to add in dynamic equilibrium of internal environment, and I gave you everything else. And then I listed several different systems that contribute to homeostasis in your body. Okay, but the ultimate control falls upon your nervous system controlling your endocrine system. So on ultimate control, you want to put nervous system that controls the endocrine system. Okay, now you, there are other ones, right? Um, we know about the kidneys and nitrogenous waste and the pH of your blood and actually encouraging red blood cell formation. So there's a lot of different organs that do a lot of different things, but ultimately it comes down to the nervous system and the endocrine system, which control your body. So on that note, let's talk about thermoregulation. Okay. So what do we do when we're cold? We shiver, right? That's a physiological response. It's hard to say, I'm not going to shiver. Okay. Cause you will, right? That's a physiological response. A behavior would be if you're cold, you would walk over and put on a what? 
jacket. That would be a behavior that you would do as a result of being cold, right? Same thing, hot, sweat, take off the jacket. So um, on strategies to regulate body temperature and metabolism, this homeostatic um, regulation. So these are some of the physiological things we can do. Muscles can contract, um, right? We make our bodies smaller when we're cold. So we have less surface area per volume and we make our body larger, right? Spread out a little bit more when we're trying to cool off. Now, um, being... Um, um, poikilothermic versus homeothermic. So the old school names would be um, cold-blooded and warm-blooded, um, ectotherms, endotherms. So poikilothermic, your temperature changes with the environment, right? If it's colder, you're colder. If it's hotter, you're going to be hotter. There's a lot of hiking hills behind our house. So we do a lot of hiking, my husband and I. And I do not like to hike in the summer midday. You know why? I am scared. And if you've seen on TikTok, I put like three videos of snakes I found. I'm afraid of those snakes and I don't want to get bitten. And the deal is in the heat of the day, that's when they are the most active, right? If it's cold, then they're going to be trying to heat up and they are not, their enzymes aren't going to function as well and they have less likely a chance of biting me. Whereas, you know, if you run into a polar bear, he's going to wipe your face off regardless if it's colder or a little bit warmer outside because it's a mammal. So what they, there are two different strategies here, the cheap and the expensive way. Okay. This cheap way of a snake is you're not investing a lot of energy into keeping your body at a certain temperature, but this limits where you can live. This is the expensive way. You invest a lot of calories into maintaining your body temperature, but it allows you to adapt and to live in more environments. So poikilothermic, cold-blooded, ectotherms, ectotherms, and I gave you all invertebrates, fish, amphibians, and reptiles, body temperature fluctuates depending on the environmental temperature environmental temperature. So cost benefit analysis, it saves energy, but it restricts them from living in extreme environments. Whereas if you are homeothermic, you are warm blooded or endotherm, um, this would be birds and mammals, birds and mammals, they have mechanisms to regulate um, their body temperature. On cost benefit analysis, they're, it's energetically expensive, but it's advantageous that they can adapt to various environments, adapt to various environments. And typically, I get another picture here. Oh, here's this. So homeothermic, constant body temperature, and you, and Okay, so let me just go back a little bit more. Fairly constant body temperature independently of the environmental temperature by using physiological mechanisms. Poikilothermic, okay, an animal that is unable to maintain its body temperature within um, narrow limits using physiological mechanisms, although many do so using what? Behavioral mechanisms, all right? And that's where it ties in. Behaviors that we might have as an organism dependent on how we access and respond in our environment. All right, so here, what I wanted to get, oh, just another review. You're welcome to look at that. All right, metabolic rate. There is an inverse relationship between body mass and metabolic rate if you are a homeotherm and warm-blooded. And the reason is you better have a high metabolism if you're small because you have a large surface area per volume, and so you can lose a lot of heat. When you are larger, you can afford to have a slower metabolism because you have less surface area per volume, less surface area per volume. So that's why there's typically an inverse relationship between body mass and metabolic rate. The larger the animal, the slower the metabolism. All right. So organisms respond to changes in their environment, right, by doing different things. It could be a behavioral mechanisms to warm their body up or turn towards the sun. Plants will grow. Remember we talked about tropisms and phototropism grow towards the light. Okay. We have our nervous system to take in stimuli and then respond in, with our behavior. And um, one of those ways to respond um, is to just dehydrate. We don't, we don't have that option. Um, but um, anhydrobiosis, a dormant state induced by drought. So that's their environment, drought, in which an organism becomes almost completely dehydrated and reduces, so you need that word, dehydrated and reduces its metabolic activity to an imperceptible level. 
Um, it occurs in small invertebrates um, such as tardigrades. I think you know them as also water bears um, and um, some plant seeds. Okay, and some plant seeds. So that's one way to respond to your environment with a behavior. Um, another one is hibernation. So why do the bears hibernate? Well, okay, it's an adaptation that helps them conserve energy. They can remain inactive. They slow down their metabolism because they're not doing anything, right? And they can do it for days, weeks, or months at a time. And they do it when the food is scarce, right? I'm just going to slow down and do nothing because I don't have a lot of food out there. So um, you want to add on your notes, certain mammals is an adaptation to adverse winter conditions. Probably not a lot of food available. Okay, here's another behavior is migration. And we talked about that a little bit earlier as well. And why do they migrate? Well, why do they do it? It resources on the earth fluctuate. So they need to go where the resources are. Okay. And so on your notes, you're seeking resources that are not available year round and it is collective travel. You're traveling in a group, maybe a little bit safer with deferred rewards. Okay. And then um, if you look here, and why not find a shorter, simpler journey? The simple answer is the benefits of long distance migration outweigh its cost. Um, and so it persists. So on your notes, they involve special behaviors of preparation, such as overfeeding. Um, and so they'll eat when there's an abundance of food in order to prepare for their migratory movement. And they demand special allocations of energy, special allocations of energy. So it, and it could be changing even forms of their body, right? If they're an insect, they may be changing into a migratory um, body. Um, migrating animals maintain a fervid, and this is a quote, um, attentive to the greater mission, which keeps them undistracted by temptations and undeterred by the challenges that would turn other animals aside. Okay, and yet another one I want to touch on is countercurrent exchange. Now, countercurrent is when you're running anti parallel. So, for instance, in the gills of fish, okay, the direction that the water flows, okay, the water flows in one direction, their blood flow in their gills is in the opposite direction. And the, the reason why that is incredibly advantageous is because when the water it has the highest level of oxygen, that blood has been exposed to the most water. And so it always promotes um, the diffusion going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. And as the water is leaving the gills, it has the lowest oxygen concentration, but that's when the blood is coming in at its lowest too. So it always promotes diffusion when there is a countercurrent flow. When there is a concurrent flow, then as soon as it evens out, you're done. So you're trying to maximize your resources. There's Physio physiologically, like mammals, their their noses, um, and with um, keeping the moisture out of the air that they have, so they don't lose moisture through um, exhaling. They run a countercurrent. Birds um, in their lungs, they run a countercurrent. We do too in our lungs as well. So countercurrent exchange. Um, is the word you need in there, fluid side by side in opposite direction, maximizing exchange with the environment. And then I gave you several examples there. And then one more, okay, and that is mutations. To deal with environmental stress is turn up the mutations because you might get a mutation that helps you to be more likely to survive. So possibly an evolutionary mechanism to deal with environmental stress. And my friends, um, that is the end of chapter 43, Behavior. And if you're one of my students, I'll see you.